This film is funded in part under a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. His name is Alexander Napoleon Ulysses Latour. My name is J.C. Boudreau from Cameron, and 60 years ago, I was selected to make a film of Louisiana story. We walked the gate down to see a Tarzan movie. Yeah, and, and these people come by in that station wagon, and they asked if I was J.C. Boudreau. I told them, yeah. I says, well, I said, we need to take some pictures of you. We're going to make a movie star out of you. Yeah, well, movie star at that time, I didn't even know what that was. Near the end of World War II, the Standard Oil Company foresaw an American future powered by petroleum. To persuade the nation, the company hired Robert Flaherty, the legendary filmmaker. Flaherty and his wife traveled the Southwest, searching for their story. At last, picnicking along a Louisiana bayou, they found it. We knew we had our picture, Flaherty said. It was a story built around that derrick which moved so majestically in the wilderness, pro for oil beneath the watery ooze, and then moved on again, leaving the land as untouched as before it came. That was the vision that Robert Flaherty gave his audiences, looking through the lens of Louisiana's story. But what did those on the other side of the lens see, looking back? Beginning his career in the silent film era, Robert Flaherty has long been called the father of documentary film. The documentary starts with the French, that you maybe, it's the Brothers Lumière. These are the first documentary makers, in a sense, that they were recording reality, but they didn't know what they were doing. They were just having their, uh, like their crew uh, saying, uh, film this, film that, and it comes back. Now, documentary making is also storytelling. It's also showing us unknown areas, and in that extent, he is the first one. His film, uh, uh, Nanook of the North, is a classical film, which we all see as a first, uh, first film in the, in the film schools. When Flaherty got Nanook of the North distributed in theaters, it was the first, and everybody was absolutely astounded. It worked. It became an international favorite. Um, it was the most successful film he ever made. I think Flaherty is among the most important, certainly among the top American directors. He was the first person to make believable real-life dramas. I think if you summed up Flaherty's work into one sentence, it would be, how we, as human beings, live with the environment. In his final work, Flaherty would offer film's first look at a people then regarded as some of the most exotic of Americans. It's like a magical uh, uh, impression it gave me. I couldn't say exactly why, because there's not so much dialogue in it, there is not so much uh, contents in it. No, mama. We all know the work of Flaherty, and it was interesting to see him uh, changing through, through and ending in a film like uh, Louisiana Stories. In the 1940s, coastal Louisiana remained one of the most isolated places in the United States. Since colonial times, it has been the homeland of the French-speaking Acadians, or Cajuns, as we're often called today. By the standards of other Americans, the people here were desperately poor. Many made their home in the wilderness, much as their ancestors had for generations. But momentous changes were coming to the land and its people. Flaherty recognized this. He had this uncanny ability to look at an environment and see it in cinematic and artistic ways. He also had a nice knack for finding people 
he could use to project his ideas. Uh, so in the casting of this film, he found some wonderful people who, even though they had no acting experience whatsoever, understood what he wanted and gave him masterful performances. Twenty years earlier, Flaherty had made Nanook an icon of the Inuit people in the popular imagination. Now he needed to find someone who could embody the Acadians of Louisiana. He had in mind a boy, but it had to be a truly exceptional boy. Well, we found J.C., so we saw screen tests the first time in my life, and we screened the the screen to us, when J.C. smiled, the whole world lit up. And so Flaherty was absolutely delighted. He said, go get him. Robert and Francis Flaherty rented a rambling old house in the town of Abbeville, Louisiana. They were joined by Ricky Leacock, Flaherty's young cinematographer, and the film's editor, Helen Vom Dongin. For the next 14 months, it would be home for the production's tiny crew and cast. About twice a month, Mr. Flaherty would get his violin out and Miss, Miss Flaherty would play the piano. But we all had to get in there and sit down. It was like a concert to us, you know. And you best be quiet and listen. <laughs> We'd watch the, uh, you know, the films whenever they, you know, after they develop and they come back with clients, usually was operating the projector. And we just all sit down in the hallway and just watch it. I'd help Richard Leacock, you know, he'd, he'd show me how to do it, and we'd, we'd cut some of it out that wasn't good, and put some of it in that was good. Oh, God, he screamed. I was going crazy looking at this stuff. And if something wasn't right, he screamed it even more. And then we would go and do something again, and try another approach and another approach until he was happy. Louisiana's story achieved some of the most poetic images in the history of documentary cinema when Flaherty directed Ricky Leacock to train his lens on the machines in the wilderness. We shot the drilling of the oil well. Like any sensible people, we did it in daylight. And it was fine. And the oil company executives came and looked at it, and they loved it. And when we were running out of money and time, Flaherty called me in and said, Ricky, we're going to reshoot it at night. Every time I see them drilling at night, I find it more exciting. I thought he was crazy. We didn't have any lights to speak of him. I spent a week climbing all over that oil rig, putting the, the, the reflector flood spot had just been invented, and putting those up. And I had some other lights, and we did it. And it went like flash. He was so right, because it, you concentrated on the drillers and the drilling. As I'm sure Ricky Leacock tell you, he was um, a very uh, demanding director. Uh, he wanted what he wanted. He wanted his vision. Uh, and if someone else was going to push the button on the camera, it had to look right for him. Flaherty had hand-cranked Moana, Nanook. All of them were hand-cranked. But as it changed, hand crank films was shot at 16 frames a second. That's two turns of the handle a second. Da, 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 We were very good at that. Now it was 24 frames. That's three turns per second. Drives you absolutely up the wall. It's so difficult to do. He did it himself. All the shots of the well blowing up, the actual shots of the spouting out of it, he made hand crank. As I said, he didn't need a cameraman. He was the best. With his wife, Frances, Robert Flaherty had contrived a story about the harmonious relationship between a traditional Acadian family, the unspoiled wilderness where they lived, 
and the advent of modern American industry. I think Louisiana's story portrays Cajun culture remarkably accurately for the most part. I think there were some things that Flaherty you know, may have gotten caught up in, but I mean, he really was letting that family or those players, those not actors, if you will, those, those participants, uh, tell him, here's what I would do, here's what I would say, here's, what, here's how I would react to this. When oil men arrive in the swamp, the father of the Latour family is skeptical of the strangers and their promise of new prosperity. However, his 13-year-old son, played by J.C. Boudreau, is irresistibly drawn to the kindly newcomers and their mysterious machines. But is it a true story? I believe most people thought that it was more of a documentary than it actually was. Now, this is not to say it, was, it tells the wrong story, or you know, but but there's a lot of there's a lot of that story that is manipulated. He was directing quite everything from behind the camera. Now, people accuse him of not really being documentaries. Nobody could make documentaries in the modern sense then. Everything had to be set up and reenacted. Oh, he's definitely a nonfiction filmmaker. This is nonfiction in the sense that it's an att attempt by one person to portray the lives of other people as genuinely and as honestly as it's possible. Uh, I, that doesn't make it true, it doesn't make it false, it makes it his vision of these people. But I think in retrospect, he did a pretty good job of representing all the people in his films. In Louisiana's story, the actors were virtually identical to the characters they portrayed. You know, I've, I've always been a boy out in the open, you know, always hunting and fishing, and it really wasn't that much, you know, difference in the, you know, in the lifestyle. I started an alligator hunting when I was probably about eight, nine year old. I still hunt alligators, I hunted this year. But I found out one thing, don't kill more alligators than you can skin the next day. I got greedy one time and I killed nine. I had to skin them suckers the next day. And nine alligators are without alligators are good skinning them one day by yourself. Especially when you got some seven, eight footers. I had a lot of alligator skinning. So I learned from experience to kill two, three of them <laughs> and go home and be satisfied. <laughs> Looking through the eyes of J.C. Boudreau, Flattery's Louisiana story views the coming of modern industry with a sense of wonder and allure. I had never seen a rig before. And, man, that was one of the strangest sights I've ever saw, seeing this big, humongous thing coming in that canal pool by a little bitty old tug. It's fascinating. This must have been mind-boggling. This was a, a technology that he probably knew little, if anything, about to come you know, right there to him and for him to actually be a part of it, to climb up on the derrick, to talk to the uh, oil men who are working there. It had to have a profound effect on him. Documentary or not, in filmmaking, the lens changes what it sees. Often people are surprised by the images of themselves projected on the screen. Whenever I first saw it, it was... It was a shock. You know, we, you know, we make little pieces here and little pieces there, and whenever they're showing a the rush upon the, upon the projector, you know, it's not no whole big bunch of it. And here we are, going to the Frank Theater and watching this movie. It, it's amazing. Filmmakers have always struggled with what it means to tell the truth in this medium. Many look to Flaherty. The interaction between Flaherty and his characters in his films has been exemplary. Flaherty was constantly listening to them and their response to what he was doing and altering his behavior while he was filming. Uh, and that's what an ethnographer or a folklorist or anyone else who, who deals with human behavior has to do, both in, uh, for intellectual and ethical reasons. But one of the movie's most memorable scenes was also the most carefully staged. The real alligator, I took him and put him on in, in the bank. And Flaherty decided, no, that's too short. We need more than this. 
he needs to pull you out. So they stuck a pole out in the water up there, and they had two people on one end and me on the other end and the rope around it. And they, they drug me in the water. He said, you, your function is to maintain, to create visual tension in the audience from beginning to end and you never give away the whole story. You know what? Whenever the alligator hissed at the nest, would you believe I jumped? <laughs> I was like the rest of them. Robert Flaherty clearly intended to show an honest image of native Acadians in the place where we make our home. But his movie was also quietly doing something more than this. Louisiana's story was bought and paid for by Standard Oil to promote the interest of the industry and to sell Americans on the promise of an oil economy. Flaherty wrote a brief treatment of what he had in mind. The oil company lawyers insisted on his initialing every page of the script so that they could hold him to it. It seems to me that from Flaherty's point of view, the introduction of oil rigging technology into the bayous was not a bad thing. It was a good thing. Uh, it would bring prosperity to the people there. It would bring much needed natural resources to, to us. We have a different perspective on that now. But at the time, it was not an unreasonable assumption. Really, the genius of Flaherty is that he showed what Standard Oil likely intended, but he also loaded it, loaded his film with all of the other possibilities as well. In hindsight, you start realizing, well, you know, this family's gonna start becoming attached to money, dependent on it, where they had not been before, so this is like Christmas and summer. You know, people are gonna start realizing, if they find all of my land, I get I get something out of this. And the kid then uh, is shown climbing what the oil industry calls a Christmas tree. And he's waving to the oil industry guys. I don't think that's an accident at all. It's insinuating that there is going to be a very close relationship between this traditional culture and this modern technology. That too was a premonition. It was, he was right on the money. When I grew up, you never heard a word of English. <laughs> I went to school, and of course it was against the rules to speak French at school, but on the playground you didn't hear any English. And the oil companies came in and began hiring young men and paying them money like nobody had seen. And eventually he started speaking a little bit like a Texan or an Oklahoma person. And they were happy that they were making money, but it made the older people feel like they were losing their kids to something from the outside and becoming more Americanized. It's like the oil companies were just an agent of Americanization. You know, it's gonna happen one way or another. This is a part of a, a, a moment in time where we thought everything was going forward was gonna get just better and brighter. And we, we didn't realize as a nation, as a people here in South Louisiana, that there, the dark side could creep as much as it did. What Louisiana Story captures is a kind of conflict of cultures. When we think about Cajun folk culture and Creole folk cultures, those folk cultures of, of South Louisiana, they're often about balance, balance between people, balance between people and the landscape. What oil industry brought with it is not a sense of balance. It's a sense of progress, of movement, of, of moving in only one direction. Images in the movie imply what this progress would mean for many French Louisianans. That crew boat comes by abnormally fast, faster than anything in the experience of that family or that kid. The first few boats kind of shake everything up, and he, but he's, he's, he's hanging on, and then that, that uh, crew boat goes by real fast and creates a wake that turns him over. I thought that was a really interesting image to sort of representing the whole issue that the film was about. The ability of this traditional culture to withstand, to even anticipate, and then to withstand the arrival of this, this huge contraption. The boat passed by three times, and I wouldn't get out, and after a while I heard him holler. 
He says, if he won't get out of that boat, run over him. I said, well, I said to myself, well, Mr. Flat is getting serious about this now. <laughs> so, so here comes the boat for the fourth time, so I jumped out. <laughs> but it was, it was about November. It was cold. From behind his camera, Flaherty had seen firsthand how modern influences threatened to swamp traditional cultures around the world. Louisiana's story was a familiar one, but the outcome of the story is not always simple and straightforward. We've tended to think about folk cultures as being this, living this kind of idyllic past and being unchanging, but they were always changing. Um, but what the oil industry did by coming with so many people and so much money and so much equipment was change things so quickly. There wasn't really time for reflection of what we were gaining and what we were losing. It brought loss in the sense of a family and communities were often torn apart by the amount of money coming into an area, but also brought with it money to build better hospitals, to build better roads, to build better schools. It brought a lot of money into an economy that didn't have any money. It done a lot to me, it, it made a living for me. Any time they'd bring in a well, well they had to have a pipeline laid, you know, ship the oil wherever it's supposed to go. Well, that would give me a job, so he was a benefit right there. Just like the character he played, J.C. Boudreau was shaped by the same turbulent forces of change depicted in Louisiana's story. You seen the scenes to where, to where I went and met Mr. Hardy, sat on that bench. And they got what they call a spinning chain, that's when it tightens the pipe up. Now when that thing comes bouncing and flying, it, make, it makes you want to pay attention. Years come after I done that same type of work, after, after I got grown. I, I was throwing the chain and watching all this stuff. and I, It could be because of Louisiana stories that I went to work on the rig, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I fascinated how things operate. There's no doubt that the oil industry has come a part of Louisiana's folk culture. The roughneck, the roustabout, the, the man who can do, who can see a problem and get it done, it certainly feeds right into the Cajun and Creole sense of self-sufficiency. In 1957, Hurricane Audrey took it, took my, my home and everything we own. And then, 50 years later, here comes Rita. Well, she takes my second home. Well, this is where home was at until the old storm come through. Kind of clean this all out. The only thing left is pecan trees. We kind of used to camping, but whenever you camp in the FEMA trailer, it's really not the best place in, in the world to live at. So, you know, we really want to get home. And it may be three or four or five years before I go back in, but I will, I will go back. Production wrapped in 1947, and J.C. Boudreau left the town of Abbeville, where he'd lived for the last 14 months to return to his home in the coastal marshes. But home was no longer where it used to be. His family had relocated to another island. They sent me home on a, on a Chris Craft. We had all my belongings on that boat, and they're sending me to Little Pecan Island, which I didn't know where Little Pecan Island was at. My folks didn't know I was coming in. It was a surprise to me to find the island, and a surprise to Mom and them that I got home. The money I made from the movie went to my, to my mother and stepfather. Father and I went to Lake Charles, and we bought some propane bottles and, and the gas range and the, you know, refrigerator, and then we got back. Well, then, you know, at, at, least, at least we could keep our milk cold. $3,000 back in 1948, that's a lot of money. The movie immortalized young J.C. Boudreau as the face of Cajun culture. And in many ways, he remains just as emblematic today. The whole film is a bit paradise lost in a way. Uh, he's showing it and saying it's probably going to change without having a militant or a radical tone. It, it's, it gives you the possibility to make your own choices or to you watch something which is passing. In fact, that's what you see in the film. Flaherty was a humanist. He believed in people. 
He loved filming people who were good at doing what they were doing, whether it was Nanook or JC or Driller. I've never worked with anyone, anyone near like him. In representing the arrival of modern American culture here, Robert Flaherty also became a lasting part of the Louisiana story he was trying to tell. For more than two generations after its debut, Louisiana's story offers a chance for people to reflect on a defining image of themselves, of who they once were, and who they are becoming. To learn more about this and other LPB programs, visit us at lpb.org. This film is funded in part under a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. We are PBS. <laughs>